Hello everyone, welcome back to Collaborative Edges, conversations to inspire initiatives across languages and cultures. I am Rocio Quispeagnoli, Professor of Hispanic Studies at Michigan State University and the host of our podcast series about projects across languages, cultures and disciplines. Today, we will talk about puppets at the center stage of several initiatives at MSU. And to do that, we have in the studio Pia Bansaf, Professor of German Studies in the Department of Linguistics and Germanic, Slavic, Asian, and African Languages, and Steve Bayback, Preparator for the Lookout Gallery in the Residential College in the Arts and Humanities, both at Michigan State University. Welcome, Steve and Pia. Thank Hello. you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Good. Um, between May 14th and September 14th this year, You both prepared and organized the exhibit Panoply of Puppets at the Lookout Art Gallery in the Residential College of Art in the Arts and Humanities and in collaboration with the Michigan State University Museum. Could you tell us more about the idea that brought, that brought you into preparing the exhibit, the puppets, and the collaboration with the MSU Museum, Pia? Oh, I should actually throw the ball back to Steve right away because he is the contact with the museum. And um, Okay, so? Uh, originally, uh, I first came to know the puppets in like 2012 when I was teaching a puppet class previously, and we just showed the puppets to our students as demos. Um, and then when P and I were teaching our, our pup power of puppetry class, mm -hmm. Uh, this past spring, uh, we were interested in showing our students again, so we actually took them into the museum collections where they could actually see the puppets and hold the puppets, but the, they were so captivating, so interesting. Um, and when we had a slot in the lookout, I proposed to Carolyn Loeb, who was a chief curator at that time, uh, that we do a show of the puppets because they sit in boxes in storage for For a long time. I wanted to give them something, you know, some life. Yes. And yeah. uh, Pia, could you tell us more how the team was assembled? How did you put it together? And with how many people did you work for the exhibit? Yes. So we were um, basically um, our class uh, that went to the museum uh, collection and uh, just fell in love with the puppets. And I think due to how the students reacted, uh, we then also picked the puppets out of this. And we had one student from our class who actually was uh, Steve's assistant mm -hmm. uh, to put together the show and, and build uh, the show. Yes. Now, I have a question out of curiosity that I'm sure many people are wondering. You both like puppets. Yeah. Could you tell us more about that? Uh, why do you like puppets? What is interesting about them? Why do you think students were captivated about, about with the puppets in the museum? Steve? I, I think as objects and as entities, they kind of hold personality and they kind of represent, uh, they have their own ethos, I guess. They, they really... I'm really captivated by the dimensional objects that activate space. Um, and then there's this relationship between the, the puppeteer and the puppets. And, and uh, I think it's, it's a real rich place for expressing ideas or having conversations that might otherwise be difficult. Yes. So. What's the difference for you between a puppet and a doll? Or are they related? Uh, I think audience might be the key. Okay. Yeah. If the, I mean, I suppose if you're sitting in a room by yourself with a puppet, it's more like a doll mm -hmm. um, in most instances. Yes. Yeah, so. Okay. And Pia, why do you like puppets? Why do you study them and work them? How do you connect them to your work? Yes. Yeah, so when I was a little child, puppet 
history was an integral part of our culture. We did not, you know, uh, we made our own entertainment. We didn't have a TV or anything. And so this was a way of making theater for us and mm -hmm. uh, playing. And I've always had this uh, soft spot for these inanimate objects that come to life when um, there are at least two people there, one who animates and the other who lets the animation touch them through um, projecting animacy onto this object. And it could be really be anything. Uh, it doesn't have to be um, a fine arts sculpture puppet. It could be a piece of paper that becomes a puppet. It's just this animacy that um, uh, emerges from this interaction between the puppeteer and the audience. Yes, it's it can be a shadow. I remember where I grew up in Peru. Sometimes we would do we would have blackouts, you know, and then we would have to use candles. And then the, one of the f few games we could play was uh, shadow puppets with our with our hands. No, I think the performance. The perform. I'm thinking the performance that is. Um, uh, a specific feature, perhaps, of puppetry. Now, um, Pia, I look into the materials included in the undergraduate course, Puppet Power, and the course portal starts with a very provocative question. Are you afraid of puppets? I must confess that when I read it, my first answer was yes. <laughs> Although I enjoy puppets as well, you know, as a kid and uh, to look at them in different places. And but your question, it was very interesting. My first answer was yes, and then I started to questioning myself. Why did I say yes? And I was not sure anymore. And it just started. Uh, I started thinking in different directions. So my first question for you, and also for Steve, why are people? Why do you think people are afraid? Some people perhaps mm. are afraid of puppets. And if this also happens with dolls, if people are afraid of dolls. Uh, Pia, let's go first with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think um, this is where the uncanny uh, valley hypothesis uh, is really um, valuable and productive to turn to. Um, so when you have an object that is inanimate, you know it's just this piece of wood, and then it starts moving in a way only a living entity would. Mm -hmm. It puts at us into a place where we have trouble categorizing properly what it is. Is it an, an inanimate object or is it alive? And so it sows this inanimacy, animacy doubt, which is an ontology, the animacy perception is an ontology, ontological um a category that is so close to um, us that if it gets disturbed, we end up feeling not comfortable. Mm -hmm. And so this um, robot roboticist from Japan, he um, formulated this uncanny valley hypothesis in saying that if you build robots that uh, increasingly look like humans, it is a waste of time because people will be scared of them. Yeah. So you could rather just leave them look like mechanical Machines, robots. Yes. That's perfectly fine. Yeah. Yes. And Steve, could you say something more about that? Well, I, fear? I don't know if I can do much better than that. That's kind of what I really feel too. Um, I think uh, they just when they start to look too much like us, Mm. Maybe that just makes us uncomfortable. Yes, that's that's yeah. a, that's a great answer, actually. Mm -hmm. it's, and I have wondered the same thing, you know, because I like dolls and I like puppets, but then at some point they may become disturbing, and I didn't know why. And it's because they look, they start looking at the, uh, uh, like us, and they differently from from dolls. Puppets have mechanism. Uh, 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 techniques, technology that they, they they give the illusion of being animated, although there is a someone animating them. So it's like creating um, humans. Or yes, I would actually say that um, the puppeteer facilitates the projection of animacy from the audience onto the puppet. That's the role of the puppeteer to facilitate this. Um, perception in the audience. 
it's not so much, I believe, um, the puppeteer who animates all by himself, but okay. it's a joint effort. And that is why I believe puppet... Oh. Yeah, puppet theater is so powerful because there's more work for the audience. Yes, yes, yes. It's a very active experience mm -hmm. for the audience. Yeah, and uh, perhaps that brings us to the the next question I have for you. Uh, you use the term puppet power. What do you mean by that, puppet power, Steve? That's a good question. I believe that uh, they really hold that power to like address things that we can't address otherwise or in, in a different way and and maybe even upset uh, what we expect um, and they can come out of out of the left field and surprise people and draw them in um, and then there's a point where people might not take them as serious because they're not really a person and Maybe they're just a puppet, but then at the same time, are they not speaking some truth? Yes, yeah. it's, it's, it's. I think a court jester kind of has a similar ability to say the truth. Yeah, it's something or some something or someone I don't know in between. Uh, Pia, could you add something more to that concept of puppet power? Yeah, I would agree with uh, Steve that there is a subversiveness that's inherent in puppetry or in puppets, the objects themselves, because they allow us um, to uh, tell stories that humans cannot really tell uh, as well. So they can be uh, protest puppets, uh, political mm -hmm. protest puppets. Um, there were puppets in Syria that was uh, that that would speak truth to power and um, you couldn't do that with humans you are not uh, yes. supposed to show your could faith. they be impersonators puppets used sure. to impersonate yes so <laughs> and to impersonate someone you know to make him or her say things that otherwise would not be said no sure okay. that's very interesting they can also yeah. let me add they can also suspend reality and mm -hmm. they can do things that we as people can't do they can fly they can they can uh they can get injured but not get injured you know mm -hmm. there's i think there's a place where they can tell a story in a in a more like back to the honesty they're the, the more honest um, yes now you mentioned that uh the MSU museum has a collection of puppets where uh, these puppets come from what parts of the world do you remember what cultures or societies or countries, more or less? Yes, yeah, so all of these puppets are donations to the museum, and so there is no um, curator collecting these specifically. There are many from Asia, um, mostly the shadow puppets from um, Indonesia. Um, we have a lot of Burmese puppets, mm -hmm. Myanmar puppets, which are very specific. Mm -hmm. um, There's uh, the Lano collection, which is a uh, it's a old Italian family that came, and these the collection there goes back to like 1860. So we're talking really old puppets, um, and they kind of show their age. Um, and the family settled in Flint, and uh, when David Lano uh, passed away, the the family donated the collection to MSU. Okay, um, good. But they're very old, and there's a beautiful juggler in there who mm. actually used to juggle balls, and there was an exploding skeleton. <laughs> um, so they're kind of a, a very European-style marionette. Um, they're very beautiful, and they kind of really exp uh, kind of have their own life. You know, like you can see that they're wear and tear. The leather is cracking. The the elastic is is really worn out. So it kind yeah. of they have like their own power just visually. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, a last question. I know that for the class you both taught on uh, puppets, the undergraduate class, you collaborated with the uh, planetarium, with the Abrams Planetarium of Michigan State University. How was that uh, collaboration? What did they contribute to the course? I'm curious about that. Mm -hmm. So we approached the planetarium because we needed a place for the shadow uh, puppetry part of our course that we could... Um, keep completely dark. Mm -hmm. And so the planetarium came to mind and we were um, 
welcomed with open arms. It was so beautiful. And we went there just to test the space and realize that we could actually project onto the dome. And that changed basically the course of the rest of the semester because this was such a, a wonderful discovery. We did not have to just use a screen at the front of the, you know, at the stage in the planetarium, but we could create an immersive experience with the use of the dome. And um, Shannon Schmall, the director of the planetarium, and John French, um, the production coordinator that they were very, very helpful in um, opening up the facilities that for us. That is great. What a, uh, 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 and a use of the planetarium that people wouldn't have thought about, you know, to use for the classes. That's fantastic. Interesting yeah. enough, originally m much of uh, planetarium spectacular shows were shadow puppetry okay because they yes. would actually create yeah. creates worlds and solar systems using found objects and projected lights okay well um thank you very much i would like to conclude this conversation um welcoming our guests and thanking them once more today and we would like uh, to invite you to visit uh, the project website or the website where the materials for the course on Puppet Power are included. Uh, Pia, could you remind us the website address? It's Kaleidos Kale Kaleidoscopia. Yeah, dot, dot C -A. C -A. Yes. And Kaleidoscopia with K. With, with the, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Either with a C or a K. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I would like to finish the recording today saying that the ideas and opinions expressed on this podcast do not reflect those of the College of Arts and Letters and any of our sponsors, sponsors or any official entities of Michigan State University. I also want to thank technical producer Daniel Trego for his support and his work and please tune in for our next podcast have a great evening